Hey there. There, I was playing a little bit from an exercise from this book, Gypsy Jazz Picking Secrets by Dennis Chang, who I have met and played with, I think, on one occasion. So I got the approval from him that it's okay to cover this book. So I want to talk about this book, give you a brief overview of what it is, but I also want to talk about this, this genre, this style of jazz, I guess subgenre called Gypsy Jazz. I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of this style of jazz and some of you might be thinking, well, this is not really relevant for me if you're a straight ahead jazz player, but I think it is because it is such an important part of jazz guitar history. Django Reinhardt, I would say, is one of the three, top three or four of jazz guitarists of all time. I guess Wes Montgomery, Charlie Christian, Joe Pass, and Django Reinhardt, but sometimes overlooked for some reason. It's important to know and understand the history of any art form you're doing. So this is the history of jazz guitar. Essentially what it is, we need to define what gypsy jazz means. It's just playing in the style of Django Reinhardt. So it's a French musician, or he was born in Belgium, I think, but a French or European style of jazz but it's American jazz. They're, they play American songbook kind of tunes. Some people don't like the term gypsy jazz for obvious reasons, but he even talks about that in the beginning of the book that it's mostly the English speaking part of the world who have a problem with the word. It's a bit derogatory, I guess, but I really don't want to get into that discussion here. You could call it uh, Django Reinhardt jazz or early jazz, but early jazz, I guess it's more a broader term. This is very specific. It's playing in the style of Django Reinhardt. So that kind of style has been alive ever since his music, but I don't think in the 70s and 80s and 90s nobody played this stuff. And then all of a sudden it came back and there was everybody was playing it for and uh, that's what I got bitten by the bug and started playing this style as well. There are many things that I've learned that I use as a straight ahead jazz player. Some of you might not know that I actually play this style. And if people call me to do gigs these days, it's mostly to play this style, which is actually not my forte, but I know how to play this style and I love this genre. So we can learn a lot from it, even if we're not going to move to France and become bona fide gypsy jazz guitar players. The main things I've learned from studying this music is technique and tone tone production and above everything else learning tunes and learning the old jazz standards before bebop like the actual real jazz american songbook tunes and you're supposed to know a lot of tunes so that's been really uh, a great learning experience for me over the years there's a very specific way to play a specific technique there's a specific way to comp there are specific tunes, there are specific guitars, there's a specific instrumentation. Everything is very specific. So if you are a jazz guitarist and decide that I want to look into this, like I did maybe, I don't know, 12 years ago or something, it can be a bit of a mystery. It's almost like joining an esoteric cult or something. And it's very hard to find good information about this. Mainly, or maybe, maybe, because it's an, more of an oral tradition, they don't really have anything written down. There are some books out there. There, Some of them are okay, but some of them are actually pretty bad. 
this is uh, the best book I've seen so far. So yeah, I, I want to get started. So let's get started. What is Gypsy Jazz picking, you might ask? It's essentially downstrokes and rest strokes. Just to give you an idea, if I play an A minor arpeggio like that, or A minor triad, I would use rest strokes. So I let the pick fall into the adjacent string. And every time I switch strings, I do a new downstroke. And then I play a downstroke on the last note as well because it's like an important downbeat. So I do this to get volume. And you might say, well, that's uh, well, that's sweep picking or economy picking. The, here's the thing, you do it on the way down, the way back as well. So here, I'll do downstroke, up, now I start with a downstroke. So three downstrokes on adjacent strings. And this might be uh, really awkward if you've never done it before, but it's really, really good to practice like this. And again, the reason we're doing this is that we need volume. We need to cut through the other instruments. And you play kind of closer to the bridge and in the book he talks about like how to find that sweet spot where you get the most volume so dennis chang has made a lot of research so he traces this technique back to mandolin exercises or mandolin schools I guess there wasn't any picking guitar method books back then, so they used these mandolin books. And uh, this was also before there were uh, amplification, right? So you needed to play loud. He also talks about how the earlier, the first jazz players, they used this technique. Unfortunately, there's not that much footage of Django Reinhardt. There's only one video of him playing that I'm aware of, and uh, I'm sure most of you have seen it, but I'll link to it anyway. But you can see if you watch other players like Barney Kessel, like they also do this. And uh, Charlie Christian apparently played with this technique as well, even though I don't think there's any footage of him. I could be wrong about that. But there is a lot of information about this in the book. And all the licks that are written out in notation and tabs are comes with explanation of the picking patterns. So once you start getting into it, you start to see the, the logic behind it. I actually thought about when I started my YouTube channel, should I make a Gypsy Jazz guitar channel? Because I was playing that style at that time, mostly. And uh, But I, there's so many people that do that already and they do a much better job at it than I would do. So I decided not to do that. Plus it's not, again, it's not my forte. But I'll link to some of my favorite YouTube channels. And Dennis Chang, the author of this book, by the way, has. Uh, a YouTube channel, but he also has like an online school, Dennis Chang School of Music, where you can order video lessons with some of the best gypsy jazz players in the world. He's got videos with non-gypsy jazz players as well, like Mike Stern and Pat Martino and others. Then there's this YouTube channel with Christian van Hammert, who is one of my favorite uh, YouTube channels. Uh, which I will also link to so you can, he's really good at explaining the, the mechanics of this technique and the comping as well. So one of the big differences from playing more normal jazz picking guitar is that you don't mute the strings. You don't put your hand resting on the strings. You, you want the strings and the guitar to resonate. So I'm not resting my hand on the strings. And then the rest strokes. Even though I think a lot of jazz players that play arch tops, they do play rest strokes. Here's another lick that you can play very common. It sounds like it's Jimmy Rosenberg. You 
can play these licks as kind of like on repeat as loops to practice the technique. It could be this too. Imagine you have an A7 going to D minor. You could play, which is an, the chord tones, G, E, C sharp, A, and then F. I hear Jimmy Rosenberg, he plays that, one of the famous players in this style. He plays that all the time. But then I'm supposed to do down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. Normally you would do this, up strokes, right? But you don't get the same attack, the same forceful kind of effect that you do when you pick this way. So again, there's tons of licks in this book with these kinds of where you can practice this technique. He also talks about the gear. There are specific guitars that you play. I'm not super good on like the history of all that. I don't, I'm not very knowledgeable about the guitars, but this is a Asian made a copy, I guess, of those guitars. And they can look like this, or they can look like that. Sometimes they look like this. And I remember first time I saw a guitar like that, I was just like, what is that? I need to know what that is. And I want one of those guitars. They sometimes play with arch tops too. But the beautiful thing about this style, and another reason why I love this style so much, is that you can play many guitars. You can have like 20 guitars jamming away on these guitars. And it sounds amazing. It's like strings, the more the merrier. It's also excellent for teaching because you have tons of people jamming, students jamming together. It's so much fun. Imagine you have 20 electric guitars plugged into amps at the same time. That's brutal. But you don't need a guitar like this. But if you really want to get into it and you want to go to the jam sessions, I think it's a good idea to get a guitar like this. It's part of the thing. And then these bridges are different too from normal steel string guitars. And we use specific strings. Usually it's uh, Argentine. These are Diadario Gypsy Jazz strings. And uh, they're a little bit lighter than normal steel strings. And these are tens. Sometimes people use 11s, I think, but uh, I use tens. Also, this, the pick is very specific. This is a five millimeter plastic, I guess. They're supposed to be tortoise shell picks, but uh, those are illegal if they're made after the seven, 1970, I think. So uh, don't buy that. There's a lot of information on how to hold the pick and how where to hit the strings and how to hit the strings and uh, to get that explosive uh, attack that you want in this style. Then there's ta he talks about this hand as well. So Django Reinhardt famously only used these two fingers to play his lines. But he, there's this uh, misunderstanding that he only had two fingers. He had these fingers too, but he didn't use them. They were kind of uh, damaged in an accident when he was really young, so he couldn't use them in his playing. But he, I think he could bar chords with those fingers. There, that's why we also use very specific voicings. Uh, when you play this style. And you can see that in the footage of him. So the first chapter is the technique, the mechanics of the technique. The second chapter is idiomatic patterns. For example, this. So again, it would be awkward if you're not used to this way of picking. Down, up, down, 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 up. There's only one upstroke, the second note of the pattern. Down, up, down, 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 down. I mean, most electric guitar players, they will play like with pull-offs and like that, right? But that's not at all what we do here. Then this kind of playing. 
Django Reinhardt played that kind of stuff all the time. They also use open strings or ghost notes to kind of create a rhythmic effect. That's the kind of thing that he would do and he would use open strings. But kind of ghosted. He also does that on the recording of one of his most famous tunes, Dark Eyes or Les Yeux Noirs. I can't remember, but it's something like that. So it's like you can use two adjacent strings and loop them like that and using this technique. So I go of the fifth fret of the A string and then open D string to two downstrokes and then upstroke. You can get the kind of rolling sound. And then you can use that same picking pattern to create lines and open strings. Which is very common in this style. It's almost like ACDC sounding. And there's tons of licks like that in this book. You can also play like chords. So that's an A triad with a ninth. So the picking pattern is, starts with up stroke and then down strokes. Up, down, 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 up, down, down, down. That was an example that he got from French guitarist Moreno Winterstein. And I guess this would work over the tune Djangology, which is one of Django Reinhardt's own tunes, which is a great jazz standard, but I never hear anybody play that outside of the gypsy jazz world. Which is a shame because it's a cool tune. And this lick would work over that. It would sound like this. <laughs> That is supposed to be twice as fast, right, that I'm doing now. I can't do that. So that's the thing with this style is that it's very demanding. You need to practice every day. It's like playing classical violin or something. You have to practice every day to keep up if you want to be on that level. So I don't really do that because I'm not a professional gypsy jazz player. So. And the tune I was playing there is Djangology, one of Django Reinhardt's more famous tunes. And the backing track I'm using is from YouTube. I think that was Gonzalo Bergara's backing track, I'm not sure. No, it's from a YouTube channel called Guitar Improvisation, which I will link to. So there's tons of Gypsy Jazz backing tracks where you can hear how they play in this style. So it's a, a very, very specific way of comping. And I don't, I'm not going to get into that in this video. There's actually not a lot about that in this book. This is more on the picking technique. But Dennis has videos on how to comp. And the best videos I've seen is by Christian von Hermert, and I will link to, to those. It's extremely frustrating when you try to learn how to comp in this style. It was for me. You kind of need to sit down with somebody who knows how to do it. You can't really explain it in the book. You have to sit and jam with somebody who knows how to do this for hours. And it's still a mystery to me. Another thing about this genre is that some players only comp. They don't solo. 
And that's for logistic reasons. I guess you mic the soloist differently than the rhythm guitars. So it's supposed to be two rhythm guitars and the lead guitar and a violin and a bass. That's the traditional instrumentation. That's the Hot Quintet de la Paris or Hot Quintet de la Fr France, I guess. Jack Reinhardt's most famous group with the violinist Stefan Grappelli, right? Who actually lived quite a long life. Other tunes you play, you play old jazz standards like All of Me or The Shake of Araby, and those tunes. Some of those tunes you will also find in more straight ahead jazz situations. Like There Will Never Be Another You is a tune that you will often hear gypsy jazz players as well as straight ahead jazz players. Then there are other tunes that The Shake of Araby, I don't think I've ever heard a, that tune on a regular jam session. There's something strange about that, I noticed. That's one of the reasons I was attracted to this style when I was in jazz college, because we don't learn like the real old jazz tunes. If I go, went to a jam and the people were asking me to play... Um, <laughs> Sweet Georgia Brown. That's a jazz cla classic. First off, I didn't know the tune and I couldn't solo over it. It was too hard. But then if somebody asked me, can you play Falling Grace by Steve Swallow? I was like, yeah. <laughs> or Very Early by Bill Evans. Those tunes are supposed to be way more difficult to play. So it's something is kind of weird there. And I blame jazz education for this because they don't teach jazz from the beginning. I think sax players do that more. They learn the Lester Young solos and Colin Hawkins. But we don't learn like the actual jazz, the early jazz tunes. And one of the reasons the guitar teachers don't want to play this stuff. They want to play, you know, Joe Pass and that kind of stuff. Another thing is that the guitar doesn't have a natural place in jazz. When we're playing jazz, it's usually a piano, sax, trumpet, you know, upright bass, drums. I should also mention that those players who only comp, some of them, I've never heard them solo. They has, they're as respected as the soloists because it's, again, it's very, very difficult to learn how to comp in this style. And it's frustrating because you, you, you know, you, you want to practice your cool stuff and then you have to sit and practice to play a G6 chord all day, which is kind of boring, but you know, you have to. So that was an example of how you can create cascading speed by using this picking technique. And uh, somebody who's really good at that is the guitarist uh, Josko Stefan. I think his name is, uh, who I think is uh, German. I don't think he's French, but I'm not sure. And uh, he's really good at that. He's got great chops. It's actually funny that some of these licks that Django Reinhardt famously played, they're so simple, but at the same time, so hard to play. He often plays, for example, this. Could be in B flat, I guess. Or F. Or even C. And it might say, well, that's super easy. But listen to how explosive it sounds when he plays it. So in order to get it that loud, you have to use this crazy technique. And here he, in this chapter, he lists five different ways to pick that same phrase. Because you can use pull-offs and hammer-ons. It's okay, but you need that kind of volume. So it's very nerdy, but uh, I love it. So that was from Dinah, a recording of Dinah from 1934. That's the thing I love about this book, that it talks about which recording it's from so you can check it out. I love books that tell you this is a lick from here so you can listen. Because the page, the notation on the page only gives you a small percentage of 
the actual information that you need. You need to hear how it's supposed to sound. And I've already checked out so many players that I've never heard of before from working with this book and recordings that I didn't know about. And all you, when you start playing this music, you hear guitar players use these licks. And you're wondering, where is that coming from? And how are they doing? How are they picking that? Well, here you will learn where these, you trace it back to where these licks are coming from. Usually it's from Jack Reinhardt. And you also get an explanation of how to pick these patterns to get it to sound like that. Another difference between this and uh, more straight ahead jazz is that we don't really care too much about the theory of music theory. The way to learn how to improvise in this style is to learn solos and licks and tunes. You learn enough tunes and licks and solos to the point where you can just start to play by ear. That's how you do it. And to me, that was very refreshing when I was in jazz college, when I was up to here with jazz theory. So don't get me wrong, I love jazz theory, as I think you know if you've been following my videos. But it's very refreshing to just put that to the side and just play by ear. We also don't care too much about, in you know, in jazz college, they always talk about you need to find your own unique voice and don't sound like anybody else. Don't learn licks because you will sound like this and that player. Find your own voice, blah, blah, blah. Here's like, no, 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 you, you play in the style. You play in the tradition. And I, th I find that uh, refreshing. He also plays these quasi-chromatic scales that you can see for example, in the footage of him, which is uh, really hard to do, especially if you have two fingers. You're supposed to do that, for example, in the tune Django's Waltz or Montagne Saint Genevieve. Sounds like this. section is even harder. That's a waltz, it's called Django's Waltz, but I don't think that, or I'm pretty sure there isn't any recording of him playing it, but there's many people who have played it over the years. And there's also all these waltzes, because besides playing American jazz tunes, they also play a lot of like French musette, I think the genre is called, so waltzes. And these waltzes, <laughs> They have this kind of uh, musical language in them, so... So if you learn those, you will actually get the licks from those waltzes. Another lick is called uh, Indifference, I think it's called, which goes... there was so there's so many of them my latest video was on etudes and i was talking about how there aren't that many etudes for us jazz players but here we have these waltzes which are great as etudes so you could just play those for an hour a day and then you will have your chops together so i'm moving very fast here the next chapter is on pick strokes then there's chapter four ornaments that's another big thing i learned from playing this style because when you play arpeggios, they're just arpeggios. But Django had this ability to make the arpeggios sound like music. So just using ornamentation. And that gives the arpeggios more personality. 
Another thing they do in this style, they bend, which uh, a lot of jazz players don't bend. I don't do a lot of that, but Jack Reiner bend it all the time. So that's another reason we don't use too heavy strings, I guess. But he shows you a few examples of how to use this ornamentation or ornaments. Another example would be this, which is from probably Django Reinhardt's most famous solo, Minor Swing. There are two famous solos or recordings of Minor Swing, and this is from the most famous. I just love that. And then you can play it like him with two fingers. So you also, you learn licks and you learn those difficult heads, the tunes, and then you learn solos. Some of his solos are so famous that it's almost like tunes. People play them like they're actual melodies. And the minor swing solo, for example, is one. A lot of people play this solo. That was a bit from that solo. I wasn't doing a great job. I haven't played that in a while, but there you have that phrase. So just listening to how he's phrasing and using those ornaments, it's a huge part of playing in this style. And again, that's a kind of a important, right? Because if we try to play like Charlie Parker, we're not really playing guitar, but if we try to play like Django, we'll get like, guitar isms and uh, I can see the point in trying to sound like a different instrument. For me, I am a guitarist. I want to sound like I'm playing guitar. I remember seeing an interview with Alan Holsworth where he said he doesn't even like the sound of the guitar and he didn't want to, never want to sound like a guitarist. He wants to sound like a saxophone or something. And I can see that. I can see the that's great. He's obviously ridiculously amazing. But for me, I really want to sound like I'm playing the guitar. Maybe it's because I started with classical guitar. I love the sound of an acoustic guitar. I should mention that you can play electric guitar. You can play arch tops. And Django played electric guitar, I think it's more at the end of his career. And it sounds amazing. He also used a, like a, I think it's called steamer, like a magnetic pickup that some people use because it's hard to mic this instrument. And Ideally, you play it acoustically if you play in a small cafe or something. But if you're on a bigger stage, you need to mic everything. And uh, sometimes people use magnetic pickups. They're called steamer. And uh, it makes it sound like an electric guitar. And it, Django used those, and it sounds very much like some of his recordings. I'm not a huge fan of that sound, but uh, it is part of the style. Yeah, then he talks about the bending and the other techniques that are specific for... Uh, Django Reinhardt's playing. Sometimes he'll do like slides. And it's important to uh, listen to Django Reinhardt and uh, to kind of get a feel for it. There's also a lot of mention here of other gypsy jazz guitar players. So you can check out like Chavalo Schmidt, Stockel Rosenberg obviously is huge, Jimmy Rosenberg, etc. So the, we have the kind of the older generation, I guess, uh, like. Chavalo Schmidt, but then you have like a, also a newer generation of gypsy jazz players like Adrian Moniad and Sebastian Genet and, and uh, Antoine Boyer and those guys, and they are playing more modern style and they are they not as traditional. So some players are very traditional, very orthodox, but then there are other players who are playing 
not as orthodox. There are also examples of guitar players who play this style that are not traditional at all. They don't even play with these instruments. An example of that would be Tommy Emanuel. I've heard him play Django Reinhardt music with sometimes with gypsy jazz players and he brings his guitar in the way he plays he doesn't comp in that style it's not you know orthodox but it sounds amazing because clearly he's a Django Reinhardt lover but he doesn't he's not a proper gypsy jazz player and uh, Frank Vignola I think is another example of a guitarist who is not really a gypsy jazz player he's more of an early jazz player he, he seems to be an expert on like Eddie Lang and those stuff. Eddie Lang, I think, was one of the influences for Django Reinhardt, I think. And uh, he can also play this style, but he doesn't have this guitar, even though I have seen him play these guitars as well. Also, I think Joe Pass made a record called Django Reinhardt, right? Which is a ce celebration of Django's music. So some of Django's most famous tunes are obviously Minor Swing. <laughs> The dark eyes which is a traditional like old maybe Russian tune and then of course uh, Nuage is one of his most famous tunes There's also certain solos that are very famous. One of his solos is this uh, I'll See You In My Dreams. Which is another solo that players learn note for note. It's such an epic solo, it's perfect from beginning to end. And so what you do is you memorize the whole solo and then you learn the licks from the solo. And another one is uh, Django's Tiger, which is a very noty tune, very kind of technically difficult. And the solo there is also very epic. So if you, let's say you would practice the minor swing solo, the Django's Tiger, I'll see you in my dreams, and some of those waltzes, if you do that every day, then you would keep up kind of the technique required to play in the style. Then there's the chapter of vocabulary. So I love this. He's I had licks that divided into what chord you use them over. So you have major chords. They didn't play major sevens, they played major six, major six nine. Uh, so then your lick could sound like this. That's a very common lick. I just discovered lick. This is my new favorite lick. Works over C major. Love that lick. Then minor chord, static minor chords, as opposed to a minor chord in a 2 5, right? So. Uh, that's a standard jazz, gypsy jazz phrase. And then you need uh, licks for the dominant chord. So it's different if it's a dominant flat nine going into minor chord kind of, or a uh, dominant with a regular nine. So this could be E7. So then you would put it together to over minor swing, let's say, just play that lick. And then play it on D minor. And then the dominant. So 
that's how you practice. You practice over the, you go to the YouTube and find the backing tracks and then you play these licks over and over, like etudes, until you have it under your fingers so that you can play them without thinking. I guess it's kind of the same when you're learning to play country guitar, right? You just learn licks that work over specific chords and you do it enough, then you can just play after a while. You don't sit and think about, oh, it's this scale and, you know, it's a hexatonic here. It's just licks and chords. This lick work over this chord. That's all you need to know. Then there are two five one licks because we don't think about two five ones that much in this style. But uh, I mean, there are two fives in this uh, style, obviously. So maybe a, a two five one lick could sound like this. If we have a two five one to G, it could be like this. That's very different from, you know, like a more Charlotte Parker. So gypsy jazz players do play that kind of stuff too, but it's, if you do it too much, it doesn't sound like you're playing gypsy jazz. There's also a progression that we often find in these older tunes. For example, at the ending of I Can't Give You Anything But Love. So it's like C, diminished, G, E, two, five. So you need lines that work over that. And I played one of those in the etude I played in the beginning of the video. So C. Which is interesting, it's a C triad to F sharp triad. How does that work? Well, if you know your diminished stuff and your Barry Harry stuff, you'll know the, how that works. And if it's a mystery, well, then uh, I suggest getting the book and because the secrets will be revealed. So a whole bunch of licks that work over that progression because it's all over these tunes that you find this progression. And it's kind of hard to solo over if you don't have like some kind of material that works over those chords. Then chapter six are etudes. Oh, also ending phrases, because you there you need to know how to end the tunes, and there's certain licks you can play when you at the end of the solo or the end of a tune. The most uh, obvious example is the ending of minor swing. <laughs> It's like every other gypsy jazz tune ends with. But a whole bunch of those kinds of licks. And then chapter six, etudes. And I played a beginning, in the beginning I played one of those, the one that works over, I can't give you anything but love. There's also an etude over minor swing, etude over all of me. I don't want to play them because I don't want to give away the content of the book too much here. Dark Eyes or Le Ciel Noir. There's a little bit of rhythm techniques because there are other ways than just playing swing. So this way of copying is called La Pomme. And, uh, but there's also something called Gypsy Bossa. example of that is the tune Balsa Dorado by the Rosenberg Trio. There's also Bolero. That 
that's a tune called Trublon Bolero by Django Reinhardt, which is uh, a bolero. There's also a different way to play in 3 4 or 6 8. example of that is the tune Made in France by Birelli Lagren, who is probably the most famous uh, gypsy jazz player currently. So that's the tune called Made in France, where they play like that. Some people play down, up, down, up, down, up, but you can also go down, up, down. Which is also great technical exercise to do those two down strokes in a row down up down down up down down up down you can play ballads there are different ways you can comp besides just playing la pompe and there's different ways to play la pompe some people play with a more modern style and then some people play with like an older kind of more orthodox orthodox way of playing the pop i prefer personally the modern style my favorite rhythm uh, is christian van hammert i think when he's coughing it just sounds amazing i wish i could cough like that then you can play like a more like kind of sounds like more like actual gypsy folk music, if you know what I mean. You do that sometimes. So there's a little bit of that at the end of the book. Rhythm techniques. So it's, as always, it's a very, very brief overview of the book. There's so much stuff in here. And especially a very brief overview of the, the genre. There was so many things I was planning on talking about. I probably forgot half. But some of my favorite channels you can check out, Dennis Chang, Chris Evan Hammett, Robin Nolan. It's got a whole bunch of stuff that you can check out. Licks, really good stuff. He's got some books too, I think. And uh, but I think that his books are more focused on beginners. And then, um, so yeah, I might have to get that book too. Then there's a other YouTube channel with a player I think it's Dutch, but it's got a very Swedish sounding name, Sven Jungbeck. That's how I pro would pronounce his name. I don't know how he pronounces it, but I'll link to all that stuff so you can check it out. I hope that gave you some insight into this style if you weren't too familiar with it already and that it inspired you to check out this book. Even again, I will say it again, even if you're not considering becoming a... a super bona fide hardcore gypsy jazz player there's lots of stuff that you can learn from this one of the problems with this style is right like you need to get one of these guitars which can be if you want the real thing it can be very expensive because they're usually handmade right so it's always expensive when you get a handmade guitar but there are cheaper options or more affordable options asian made guitars such as this one there's also nylon string guitars like this it's very rare but uh, i've seen sebastian Genet play nylon string uh, gypsy jazz guitars and that's like for me the dream guitar so if i get a hundred more patrons i might buy one of those but uh, yeah as always i want to thank you for your time and attention and i shall see you next time boom